Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to EDP and Applied Mathematics Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to open session 70 of this seminar. Today, we have two excellent speakers, Pierre Villos Lyon, Phil Medals, and one of the best mathematicians in the world, and Greek French mathematician Isabelle Galaver. Introducing Pierre Lyon, we have to Professor Enrique Fernandez Cara. Thank you, Enrique. You can start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to make a short presentation of Professor Pierre Louis Lyon. Uh, he is a very well known French mathematician, and as you probably all know, has contributed with a lot of important research to the fields of partial differential equations and calculus of variations. And uh, as a sign of, uh, of his high level, let me say that uh, in 1994, he was awarded with the Fields Medal. And additionally, he has received uh, a lot of prizes. Uh, the prize Paul uh, Gaston Emile Bluté of the French Academy of Science, the prize of the Philip Morris Company, and the uh, Ampere Prize, among others. Uh, he is professor of partial differential equations and the applications at the College, of, uh, College de France in Paris, as well, and uh, also professor at Ecole Polytechnique. And since uh, several years, uh, he has also been a visiting professor at the University of Chicago. His many contributions concern operator, operators theory, with results about maximal monotone operators in Hilbert spaces, uh, calculus of variations where he introduced uh, the celebrated concentration compactness missile, the transport and Boltzmann equations, viscosity solutions, and mean field gains, among others. Uh, the data from Mazinet are impressive. Uh, let me say just that they indicate more than 35,000 sites or 10 books and more than 300 or articles in uh, uh, renowned uh, reviews. So uh, let me also say as a, uh, an additional data that more than 50 pa papers from him have been cited more than 100 times, which is an incredible record uh, nowadays. So uh, thank you very much for accepting the, uh, the invitation to this uh, seminar. Uh, today, uh, he is going to um, speak us about uh, large random matrices and PDs. So you can start when you want, and uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Professor Enrique. No, I, I'm I'm smiling because uh, I was expecting you to to call me Pierre Louis because we have known each other for quite a of few course. years, <laughs> uh, and we don't want to make the effort of remembering exactly how many years we have known each other. Uh, uh, so the the good news is that. Uh, um, you have a good talk tonight by Isabel Gallagher. <laughs> the bad news is that I'm beginning. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I have to apologize, but uh, uh, after my talk, I will disappear quickly after questions, of course, if uh, if they are, uh, uh, because the day has been really, really too long. Um, don't worry too much. OK, now I have a problem. Uh, OK, that's OK. I have difficulties to move my, okay. Um, yeah, you, you just heard uh, large random matrices. You may worry about uh, having PDs, uh, probability theory and, and so on. Um, okay, I will try to make it as easy as possible and the probabilistic part uh, will be uh, as light as possible. Uh, so this is the summary of the lecture, which is of the talk, which is going to be uh, which is going to be short. Um, so one, two, three, part one, two, three, our joint work with Charles Bertucci, um, Merwan Deba, and Jean-Michel Deba and Jean-Michel Lasserie. Um, uh, Charles Bertucci and Jean-Michel Lasserie are uh, mathematicians. Merwan Deba is uh, both a mathematician and an engineer. And an engineer a telecommunication engineer. 
until two years ago, he was in charge of uh, Huawei, you know, the Chinese uh, telecommunication monster. Uh, uh, he was in charge of uh, the uh, um, research and development in France, uh, where, where uh, with uh, maybe more than 60 PhD or something. Uh, he has now moved to uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, where he's heading a, a, a research institute on uh, uh, telecommunications and um, and uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, so Merwan was the one who brought out that attention to the, the topic I'm going to discuss because of the applications to uh, uh, to telecommunications and again, more precisely mobile networks. And uh, the last part uh, about Laos deviations and uh, Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation in Wasserstrom space is uh, a joint work with, uh, with Charles Bertucci and uh, uh, Taki Suganidis. One, two, three uh, can be, uh, if you want more details or, uh, or, or, uh, or you know, getting at it. Uh, in a more reasonable, slow, in a slower way, uh, you can watch the videos of my course at Collège de France, especially if you have trouble sleeping at night. Uh, so, let me first remind you uh, that this is a very classical topic that goes back to Wishart in 1928 for correlation matrices and uh, Wigner in 1958, uh, Dyson 1962, uh, for the following symmetric matrix, uh, which is uh, one of a square root of n, n is the size of a matrix, okay? Matrix n by n. Uh, one of a square root of n, that's a normalization factor, and what you have is a symmetric part of a matrix, which consists of a bunch of uh, independently distributed, uh, uh, independent, oh, I'm sorry, independent, identically distributed Gaussian random variables. Okay, so you need Gaussian ra ra random variables which are, uh, which are centered and which are um, uh, independent. Okay, so that's big large random matrices. The reason why uh, we should look at such matrices is completely different from the one, uh, the reasons that uh, Wigner looked at those. Uh, Wigner looked at those uh, uh, in order to try uh, with a, an incredible conjecture, which is far from being proven about the spectrum of uh, atoms and uh, the connections with the spectra of random matrices. This is a famous conjecture uh, and uh, well, very little is known. Uh, okay, so what did uh, what did uh, Wigner and uh, Dyson uh, proved it? Uh, what did they uh, observe? They observed that if you look at the eigenvalues, which are real because the matrix is symmetric, is symmetric, uh, you just order them. That's going to be the convention I will always take. So lambda one is uh, the smallest, and lambda n is going to be the greatest. Whatever. So then you look at the empirical measure built with those eigenvalues. So mathematically, this is one of the n, the sum of a Dirac mass at lambda i. So you see, this is a bunch of point mass with equal masses one n, and they are all located at the various uh, eigenvalues. Of course, as n increases, you have more and more points with little weights on the real line. And at the limit, what Wigner uh, observed and what Dyson proved is that what you get is a semicircular distribution. I will give the precise formula later on. Wishart, uh, uh, now of course, if you look at uh, one over n, w n, w n transpose, w n may not be a square matrix. Notice that, uh, you know, it's like, uh, the one before multiplied by itself. So the one of a square root, since you're taking something like a square, becomes a one of n. Uh, so uh, the uh, wn is now, the w is now uh, 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 um, a rectangular matrix and uh, with uh, uh, n columns and m lines. 
and uh, m is a fraction of n or is a multiple of n uh, this uh, multiple being c which uh, which is a positive number uh, and what you have at the limit is a so-called marchenko pasteur distribution that i won't write down uh, just to simplify notations if you are interested in the classical theory uh, there are, in fact, several books by Elise Guillonnet, uh, who, uh, on top of those uh, uh, very clear books, uh, gave a plenary lecture at the last IMU uh, in 2022. Okay, so that's the classical stuff. Uh, the reason the, 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 it turns out that those are typically so two matrices I just showed are typical example of situations arising in many contexts, uh, uh, free probability, statistics, and uh, even more abstract, uh, more theoretical problems in, in mass. It, it has also uh, real life applications. So one of which is uh, finance, because you're dealing with correlation uh, matrices were of very noisy data, uh, and there is also a, a very important type of applications concerning telecommunications and more precisely mobile networks. Uh, main reason being that uh, when we sync a mobile, there is a device, your phone, your cell phone, and uh, there is an antenna, but uh, none of those guys has a single antenna. There are many arrays, and uh, uh, so you, which creates matrices, natural matrices, which gets big. Plus, there are many cell phones, and so on. Uh, so they are very big, and the um, and the uh, the the uh, this sort matrix is very much related to the uh, ratio signal to noise ratio. Uh, so, uh, I won't have time to go more in the details, but that's, of course, because of uh, Mirwan and our relation, uh, we, uh, we started looking into it. I knew vaguely that this subject existed. I've, I knew the existence of a limit which has semicircular distributions, but I never really thought carefully about it. And because of telecommunications, we decided to, to really investigate this. Okay, so uh, before I get into uh, what we uh, did, uh, let me explain a little bit, uh, a little bit more because I want to be uh, in dynamic settings. What I described before was entirely static. Clearly, when you're talking about finance or even worse, uh, telecommunication, uh, the universe is not sta static. Uh, so let me uh, take the simplest example that again goes back to the Dyson matrix, and I will add some initial condition. Uh, so we are going to have now a, a matrix valued process. So same construction as before, forget the AN for the time being. Uh, but instead of having the, uh, the matrix WN plus WN transpose, uh, now you, you throw in a, a time dependence and WN is the same matrix as before, except that now what you have uh, as an entry for this matrix, the WIJ of T, uh, this is a uh, high ID uh, Gaussian random, uh, random variable with variance t. In other words, it's what is known as the Brownian motion. Okay, so uh, you, uh, you have this which moves with time. And so at time t equals zero, all those guys, all the WNs are zero. And you start with a given matrix. Uh, uh, which is uh, mm, uh, AN, denoted by AN, a symmetric matrix, and you assume that indeed it has a limit spectral measure. So the spectral measure is this one of N, some of the right masses at the eigenvalues of, uh, of AN, uh, that it goes tightly, uh, weakly, uh, with some control of what's going on at infinity, tightly to, uh, uh, to a probability measure M0. Okay, uh, so what happens for at time t uh, when n goes to infinity? Okay, what Dyson observed is that uh, up to uh, that in low, the eigenvalues follow the following stochastic DE. So it's uh, 
uh, so there is uh, this uh, Brownian motion floating at the end of the equation with a one over square root of n in front. So it will basically disappear as n goes to infinity. So let's concentrate on the ODE part. So ignore the DBE, uh, DBI part. Uh, and what you have is uh, some, uh, 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 you have n particles interacting uh, with a force which is uh, uh, in uh, 1 over z. Huh? Uh, you see 1 over n, some from j, g different from i, of 1 over lambda i minus lambda g. Uh, so it's a very singular force, uh, since after all, if you look at the functions 1 over x in 1d, uh, uh, it's not even integrable. Okay, so a very singular uh, interaction. Uh, and you have a similar equation for the correlation um, matrix, namely v shot matrix, and it was uh, obtained in a, uh, in a paper which uh, really uh, should receive, should have received much more attention and much more credit by Marie-France Bru. Uh, uh, who derives the equations for the in the Vichot case and derive also the equations for the eigenvectors. Uh, somehow, this has not been known, people know they exist, but it has been some considered as um, an exercise, while it was absolutely fundamental to put the theory on uh, solid grounds. But that's unfair. Well, let me make a, a feminist comment. Uh, maybe if she has been, if she had been a man, people would have uh, paid more attention. But anyway, um, this is the IF. Okay. So, uh, okay. Formally, uh, what you have is that if you look at time t and compute again the spectral measure, again all the masses at Located at the eigenvalues that now depend on time and the i of t, this goes uh, to some probability measure m that solve the following equation. This is, you know, if you're more, if you're used to uh, endpoint uh, end uh, dynamics and uh, limit, which are really Vlasov limits, that's the usual uh, suspect for uh, the limit dm over dt plus d over dx, which corresponds to the 1 over lambda i minus lambda j, the i minus j structure. Uh, and uh, what you recognize is, of course, so this is being multiplied by m because you're following the, uh, uh, you're transporting this, uh, this measure and the interaction is there. So it's a total interaction, namely the integral of 1 over x minus y, m of y. Uh, so, um, except that this uh, makes no sense, it's uh, formal, formal, and what you really should have in mind if you want to use uh, distribution language, it's so, so called principal value of 1 over x, uh, convoluted with m, or you just ignore a small interval around x, a small symmetric interval around x uh, on the integral, and take the limits. Uh, but anyway, that's more or less the definition of the principal value. Um, okay, so formal analysis, you get this uh, singular Vlasov equation. If you start with a Dirac mass, that's a Dirac mass, that's a n equals zero, all the eigenvalues initially are zero. You may worry about the uh, what what that means to solve the stochastic differential equations because uh, you have a one over lambda i minus lambda j and all the lambda i initially are the same point. But let's ignore that for the time being. Formally, if we look at the limit equation, we have a Dirac mass uh, initially, and it turns out that there is an explicit solution. So you can uh, make the horrendous computation to check. Uh, that uh, this uh, 2 over pi t uh, multiplied by the square root of the positive part of t minus x square. So that's semicircular if you plot it. And it scales uh, like x square is like t. Uh, so it's a classical heat equation scaling, a diffusion equation. So diffusive scaling, compact support equation. 
it's uh, uh, the semicircular law that I was mentioning. Uh, many proofs exist uh, which uh, make the above formal considerations rigorous, uh, and they are all more or less explicit using moment methods, Fourier analysis, uh, whatever, combinatorics, and so on. And there is one exception, which is the most recent uh, uh, part, which is uh, using a gradient flow, uh, gradient flow techniques. I won't have time to, to explain that, which it's just a reflection of the fact that uh, you have an N-body, forget the, the, the noise, you have N-body Hamilton system, so uh, having a gradient flow is uh, uh, completely natural. It's a gradient of something. Uh, however, None of the existing proof carry over to general or nonlinear models, and I wrote uh, one multiplicative and one additive cases of a nonlinear equation. So uh, this is a, the Dyson equation, the D equation, is uh, often called the um, free probability heat equation. And uh, basically, the situation was, uh, you know how to derive the equation, but you have absolutely no clue for a general diffusion equation with general coefficients or general drift. Uh, uh, every, all the proofs break down. Uh, that was the situations when we uh, got interested in, uh, in this problem. Uh, so you see a nonlinear multiplication by matrix functions of the Dyson matrix. DDN is now the evolution of the uh, 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 of the uh, Dyson matrix, and so the first nonlinear version is additive, and the second one is multiplicative. They are different because indeed we are dealing with matrices. Huh? You can combine and so on, and both contain also a deterministic drift like a force, B of X and DT. Okay, so not only the uh, the uh, uh, limit proofs break down, so, but the uniqueness proofs, understanding the uniqueness proofs for the Dyson equations break down. Uh, since uh, what you will find in the literature of proofs which are based on Fourier analysis, it turns out that Fourier works pretty well for Dyson, for pure Dyson but also moments techniques and, and so on. Uh, completely explicit, and of course, this completely breaks down when you start even adding a drift term, just a drift. It's like, you know, knowing everything about the equation and you add a first order uh, uh, drift term and uh, you don't know anything anymore. Okay, uh, fortunately, and that's uh, why I'm talking about that tonight, a general approach is possible, and that's what I'm going to try to explain. So, uh, the, um, the reason why it's possible to do something is uh, an observation which it turns out had been made, but no one had uh, ever drawn any consequence out of that. Uh, we were not aware that uh, this existed and we rediscovered it. Uh, we should have read more, but that's uh, uh, that's uh, the usual tale. Anyway, uh, this uh, observation is based upon the uh, a notion of comparison between two symmetric matrices. Well, you know that you have the uh, usual partial order relationship between two symmetric matrix where you compare everywhere the quadratic form. Uh, that's a usual comparison between A and B, but you, uh, there is a less stringent uh, 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 inequality. Uh, given by uh, what we call spectral domination. So we'll say that A is spectrally dominated by B if uh, the high Sagan values, remember that we order them in an increasing manner, uh, if the high Sagan value of A is smaller than the high Sagan value of B, which is in fact equivalent, trivial justification, to say that uh, uh, M of A 
uh, which is the empirical measure, again, the point masses at lambda A is stochastically dominated by M of B, uh, uh, which means I'm reversing the definition of uh, stochastic dominance. Uh, what stochastic dominance is for one dimensional probability is a comparison of the cumulative distribution function. So FA of X is that integral. You take all the mass all the way to X included. I just I always want my uh, increasing functions to be right continuous with left limits. And uh, uh, FA of X is then greater than FB of X. It's equivalent, okay? And then, uh, an observation which was uh, not known and which is in fact related to what I'm going to say later on on the uh, uh, spectral dominance is the fact that if M solves D, the Dyson equation, and you look at the uh, cumulative distribution function, of course, you have the equation uh, which is uh, uh, the last line, uh, which involves f and ah sorry okay so it turns out that the equation uh, that you uh, obtain since your m is df over dx there is a misprint there uh, what you have is uh, so more or less it was one of the x convoluted with m m is now df over dx you integrate by parts and you have one of the x square convoluted with f with the right sign Okay, one over x squared is even worse than one over x, and in distribution theory, what I just said is valid, provided you take the finite parts. Uh, or, in other words, you build the following integral, which is the integral of f of x minus f of y, x minus, square, x minus y squared dy, sink f smooth, so you expand around, uh, you expand around x, and the, the first order term, which is f prime of x, x minus y, vanishes by, by symmetry. Uh, so that's why this integral is almost well defined. And you recognize there what, that, that what you have is the square root of uh, minus d2 over dx squared, the uh, one dimensional Laplacian, uh, minus Laplacian. Okay. So not only it's a positive operator, but it is an operator which has maximum principle that I would denote by A0. Uh, so you have this following equation on the cumulative distribution function, a df over dt plus df over dx multiplied by A0f equals zero, okay? Quite nonlinear. Uh, quadratic nonlinearity. A0 in terms of singularity is uh, like one derivative, huh? square root of two derivative. That's one derivative. Except that it's not exactly one derivative, and many difficulties arise from that fact. Uh, so df over dt plus f, df over dx, A0, f equals zero. And of course, you know that df over dx is non negative. If you don't want to be here to, to be stuck with non negative, with increasing function, Clearly, uh, you won't change anything by uh, uh, changing df over dx into df of dx plus. And uh, if you want to deal with objects which are more general than increasing function, you choose that equation if you want to have, that's an next line, maximum principle or comparison principle formally. Uh, because A0 is indeed a maximum principal operator, so you can check that formally, if uh, you have two solutions corresponding to two initial conditions, which can be compared at t equals zero, then uh, solutions should be compared. And that's true if you have smooth solutions, uh, something that of course uh, is not uh, known and is not true, remember. Uh, the uh, uh, remember the semicircular uh, law, uh, which means that m, which is the derivative of x, is at best c one half, which means that f is c uh, one one half or c three half, which is enough to define the equation. But you can't expect uh, full smoothness; it's uh, not uh, it equation. Uh, but if you have maximum maxim principle, you can forget regularity and try to use viscosity solution. Okay. I won't 
uh, recall what viscosity solutions are. It's just uh, um, a language which allow to take care of nonlinear equations that satisfies formally a maximum principle uh, inequality. Okay, so in general, as a general nonlinear models, I uh, I mentioned uh, uh, as a motivation because typically. Uh, for telecommunications, not only you have those matrices, but you may want to act on your system uh, by uh, filtering out, by uh, uh, forcing in the spectrum in certain directions. And so it's very natural to have uh, 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 those uh, general models, which leads to those general equations, which look about the same. So you see that the uh, drift, the little b of x, that's data it's a, a, a function which is given multiplies df over dx so that's first order term and you see that you have uh, the same uh, construction uh, in the uh, 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 between parentheses is uh, a big integral it's exactly the same as before that but now it's being modulated by coefficients c of x and y uh, so, you know, it's exactly when you have the heat equation and you want to take a diffusion equation uh, in front in 1D, in front of the second derivative, what you have is a function of x. Now it's a function of x and y. So the fact that the equation is non degenerate, think of the uh, heat equation or diffusion equation, is uh, precisely saying that c of x and x is strictly positive. And uh, what pops out of the model is that C of X and Y is C of X and X uh, plus uh, a cap O of X minus Y square, uh, which has, this is part of the uh, derivation of, uh, of the equation. And we will see later on, I mean, let me just immediately say that uh, the fact that you have a little O of X minus Y is absolutely crucial for the, uh, uh, and uh, and some control of this little O is absolutely crucial for the uh, uh, uniqueness analysis. So it, it turns out that here you can uh, you, you can replace because you have a capital O of x minus y square. You can replace the whole equation as having a drift term b of x df over dx, of course the df over dt, and in between you have two terms. One term which is exactly the same term as before, df over dx, uh, yeah, as in the Dyson equation, df over dx a zero of f, which is being modulated, multiplied by a function of x, which is let's say strictly positive, because uh, if a vanishes, you have uh, this means that you're pinning some eigenvalues and uh, you have boundary conditions. You have to do uh, uh, something else. Okay, so A is strictly positive. Uh, and in between, that's the rest of the difference between C of X and Y and C of X and X. Uh, uh, what you have is DF over DX being multiplied by a nice integral operator. The singularity cancels out because of the little capital O of X minus Y square. Uh, so it's nice, uh, a, a nice integral operator. Okay, uh, but still, so it's in some sense, it's a nice perturbation. Uh, A1 is a nice perturbation of a maximum principle equation. As such, maximum principle, equa maximum principle doesn't hold anymore, but uh, you, since it's nice, you may have controls in infinity, so you can still use uh, um, <clears throat> you can you can still hope to use uh, uh, viscosity solutions. In fact, maximum principle holds if and only if c of x and y is greater or equal to zero. Anyway, so uh, I, I won't spend too much time on the uh, general nonlinear models. I will concentrate on Dyson equations, although it's uh, classical and well known. So at least you can see what's the idea of this new approach. Okay, so th this maximum principle, uh, uh, does it have a finite, uh, finite n uh, counterpart? Uh, so if we go back to the Dyson stochastic DEs and we compare the initial condition, which is the analog of comparing uh, the commutative distribution function, as I mentioned when I introduced this stoch stochastic dominance, uh, well, it turns out that it has indeed observed by several authors with extremely complicated proof that uh, lambda i is less than mu i of t. 
while it's um, well anyway it, it's very easy to check i mean it's basically already forget the uh, forget the balance motion because you're comparing two solutions they cancel out so it's odes and uh, uh, the reason is when you look at the when you plot the function one over x one over x is certainly decreasing for x positive and one over x is also decreasing for x negative and the, the fact that it's decreasing everywhere, or quite everywhere, not quite, but almost everywhere, uh, the, uh, uh, is a reason why you have a comparison between the eigenvalues. Of course, uh, at x equals zero, you have a big singularity. You jump in an increasing manner from minus infinity to plus infinity. But somehow, if there are no collisions between the eigenvalues, and uh, that's something which remains to be proven, then you don't see that singularity. And basically what you have is uh, a, a, a decreasing interaction potential, which leads to comparison. Okay. So, uh, of course, I said, well, you want to use uh, viscosity, sol viscosity solution theory. And as usual, when you have a good theory and you have a very specific example, well, the theory doesn't quite fit. But... Uh, there is an extension of viscosity solution, which is okay for the pure Dyson equation. For general models, you really have to work much harder. Uh, so anyway, if you take an initial condition, initial probability, uh, the associated cumulative distribution function, which is just a semi-continuous, so that's a theory of semi-continuous viscosity solutions, but that's okay. Uh, they are regular in the sense that uh, upper semi-continuous regularization of lower semi-continuous regularizations are easy, the upper semi-continuous regularization of the function, whatever. I mean, you, you don't create a bunch of function by successive uh, regularization, whatever. Uh, that's automatic because it's an increasing function. Um, okay, you have a comparison principle. You have a unique solution, as I just said, with a comparison principle, which is continuous if the initial condition is continuous, which is Lipschitz if the initial condition is Lipschitz. Lipschitz means the probability density is a spectral measure bounded. Okay, it's at that level. So bounded spectral measures do propagate. The last fact is a regularizing effect. If you start with a bounded uh, probability measure, namely you have a Lipschitz initial condition, uh, uh, sorry, if you start with an arbitrary probability measure, it becomes bounded immediately for T positive. It's a regularizing effect. Of course, we saw that in the part of the case of the Dirac mass and the semicircular laws. In fact, it got even better it got c1 half this is not something we know as n goes to infinity uh of course you do have the uh you you do have the convergence okay so in fact it turns out it's a contraction for all Wasserstein distances um something i'm not going to describe here let me just say that this is uh it was already sh also shown with a very complicated proof why there is a three lines proof using, uh, in some sense, the, uh, uh, an analog of the Crandall tartar lemma uh, uh, adapted to Wasserstein metrics. That's one way to prove uh, uh, what happens with the Wasserstein distance, which is very efficient. Okay, uh, a nice lemma about increasing operators, which was used quite a lot in numerical analysis for error estimates for monotone schemes. Okay, uh, contraction for all Wasserstein distances. Uh, similar results for v shot and for general nonlinear models. Uh, for the drift, you just need, uh, 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 you don't even need the drift to be continuous. It just has to be semi-Lipschitz. Uh, the limit as n goes to infinity is straightforward. In fact, formally, you should expect to have uh, viscosity solution theory work. And you have some kind of comparison principle at uh, the finite n, and you have a maximum principle equation. So viscosity solution theory tells you that you should expect the convergence and you, you, you have the strategy of proof immediately. 
uh, but here there is this singularity at x equals zero, which means that you have a, to make some technical work uh, uh, around x, and uh, that's something uh, that can be done and not very difficult. But the strategy of proof, if you know this uh, viscosity solution theory, is transparent. It turns out that the general case is not even covered by standard argument for viscosity solution, La Barre Lambert, uh, that's probably the best reference in terms of uh, for integral differential operators. And in fact, uh, new arguments are needed, which can be used to make a complete theory of germ diffusion processes and viscosity solution for integral differential operators, so linear ones without the df over dx in front. But even that with stronger uh, singularities uh, situation was not clarified. And uh, uh, I believe it is now. Uh, a conjecture, a regular equity conjecture. I believe I believe that the probability of spectral measure, the M, the F over the X, uh, is indeed regularized to be uh, to become C1 now for positive time. Uh, and in some sense, the regularity of some circular law is generic. That's the regularity one should expect at positive time. Um, this is not simple. Uh, not simple because you have a degenerate equation outside the support. So inside the support, you may envision uh, some regularity taking place, although you would need some control of M, and the equation is non-local. Uh, but what happens near the boundary of the support is uh, quite complicated. Uh, so we expect it to be true. That's a, a difficult, but very, very, very nice uh, uh, open uh, problem. Okay. Uh, this co covers more or less what I wanted to say. And again, uh, if you really want uh, to have more details, uh, look at the videos. Um, let me now say just a few words uh, for uh, about large deviations and control problem. Okay. In fact, I don't care about large deviations. Okay. So uh, this is a natural theoretical question when you have uh, a limit such as the one I just discussed when n goes to infinity, which is in some sense a key to the law of large numbers. It's in fact related to the law of large numbers. Uh, large deviation, uh, uh, central limit theory. I didn't. Uh, we didn't even look at the central limit theory, and in fact, uh, I, I don't think any, anyone did. Maybe Alice. Large deviations. Uh, there were partial results by Alice Guillonet and uh, Omar Zaytouni uh, in a monster paper. Uh, it's a monster. In fact, it's so monstrous that they forgot to write uh, some assumptions they need in order to do, to make the proofs uh, valid. Uh, but this was corrected by Alice Guillonet in a, a very nice uh, lecture notes uh, with uh, where she uh, completed the proof and slightly extended them. Okay. So basically what you have is an n-body stochastic differential equation that you can translate in an n-body n body like Fokker-Planck equation, use a standard log transform, and what you expect is that uh, all this large deviation business uh, is going to govern, is going to be governed by the following optimal control problem, uh, uh, where you want to optimize trajectories that go from uh, a given measure M0, your initial condition, and the target condition at time one, which is uh, denoted by M1. Okay, so this is uh, very much like optimal transport. Uh, so the, it's the same payoff that define uh, <clears throat> the two Wasserstein uh, distance. So it's the integral in time uh, of the integral in X of m alpha square, where m and alpha are related by the Dyson equation, except that now you have on top of that a force that's exactly like the b of x before. And so it's the alpha. So you're controlling the Dyson equation by the force, by the b of x. So now it's a general control, uh, and you minimize these uh, two guys. I, in fact, that's what I'm really interested in. 
uh, large deviations because uh, I am interested in controlling systems which are being governed uh, by uh, large random matrices. And uh, this is a typical control problem. So uh, uh, the integral of M alpha square is more or less the energy. So it's very, very natural uh, to look at this uh, control problem. And it turns out, uh, the cherry on the cake, that uh, this is also the uh, uh, the distance-like function which governs uh, 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 large deviations, at least formally. The fact that this is indeed a crucial quantity has been justified by Alice uh, uh, when uh, the uh, two measures, initial and the target ones, have five moments and finite entropy. And believe me, uh, uh, the proofs are indeed very complicated. Uh, 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 dozens and dozens of pages of probabilistic estimates. Finite, uh, and they also need to have finite entropy, uh, which is uh, uh, this guide. It's a double integral in X and Y. Okay. Uh, uh, I remember when I started uh, looking at that, I talked a little bit with Gerard Benarou, an old friend, and uh, who is a famous probabilist and uh, has been one of the pioneers of large random matrices. And he told me, well, maybe with your techniques, uh, you can prove large deviations. Right. Uh, uh, and then I, I had to remind him that, well, in fact, Alice, his former student, had already proven that. Uh, uh, but he told me, no, 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 but there are conditions and so on. Okay, so indeed, uh, it took me, uh, it took us a, a, a few years, but we were able to do it. And I, I just want to show you uh, the point. Uh, so uh, using dynamic programming approach uh, allows to justify those large deviations whenever M0 is an arbitrary probability measure with a certain moment, just two moments. No, it, it lives in P2. Uh, and M1 uh, has to be in P2, but also uh, with finite entry. Uh, and that's necessary because of the regularizing effects of uh, 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 of uh, the uh, Dyson equation. And what you have is formally an infinite dimensional uh, uh, Hamilton Jacobian equation, uh, uh, which um, uh, is set on the space of measure, or priority measures, or typically on P2. And my interest lies in the fact that this is a typical example of control problems, as I said, for systems with large random matrices. And uh, that's what you need for if you want really to uh, do some kind of dynamic optimizations of mobile networks uh, like 6G uh, or, uh, or NG in the future. future. Uh, some of you may worry, okay, but we still don't have a full 5G, uh, so still, I mean, uh, deployment of full 5G, and yeah, of course, and they are already working on 6G, but the requirements which are uh, on 6G, the requirements uh, will require major breakthrough in all sciences, including mathematics. I'm not saying this is going to be enough to solve or everything that you want to do with uh, the future mobile networks. Right now, they are five, uh, five and a half. <laughs> uh, okay, so the uh, this equation is, uh, compl is complemented with an initial condition, which is either for many control problems, just a given for a con a continuous function, or uh, a, a, a singular function uh, which uh, uh, takes a value zero at M1, the target, and plus infinity elsewhere. You're forcing the constraint through that singular uh, uh, initial condition. Of course, when you're interested in control problems, uh, the bracket is the uh, crucial quantity, but the dv over dm square, like, you know, square of some crazy gradient, uh, uh, is being replaced by more complicated Hamiltonians, uh, more general Hamiltonians that, of course, uh, are related to the model you, uh, the control model you are interested in. Okay, and uh, I'm almost there. Uh, so it turns out uh, that uh, viscosity solutions approach on the infinite dimensional equation. Uh, combining the case of uh, uh, an idea that we introduced with Mike Randall a long time ago. Uh, which uh, which is to perturb regular test functions by singular test functions here the entropy 
uh, that allow to create max and minimal points in L cubic, and that's absolutely crucial. Uh, this is related to some uh, uh, classical uh, real analysis um, uh, identity on the Hilbert transform. And combining that with a ch uh, Charles uh, adaptation to the uh, uh, to P2 of the Hilbert formulation for non singular Hamilton Jacobi equations on P. Okay, so I don't have time to, to explain that. Uh, those are uh, quite theoretical tools. Uh, the reason we, we we had this technique with my candle is that we started a long, long, long time ago uh, a series of papers. I think there were seven or eight. I don't remember uh, part, part seven, part six, or part eight uh, might have been the last one uh, uh, of uh, uh, Hamilton Jacobi equations uh, in infinite dimensional spaces. Uh, we had no clue except optimal control of PDE. We had no clue, uh, no real clue why uh, we wanted to do it. Uh, we probably got nobody interested in the subject. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, by part five or six of that series, uh, those articles may have had um, maybe what, three readers, four readers. Namely, uh, Mike and I, plus uh, one or two students that had no other choice. Uh, it turns out that, uh, in, in fact, uh, Hamilton Jacob and many equations in infinite dimensional spaces are needed. And uh, what I just told you is, uh, uh, is an example. Uh, this leads to existence, uniqueness, uh, limit as n goes to infinity, which means large deviation uh, 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 results, which are general, and uh, where the strategy of proof is transparent, call of transformation, you have uh, Hamilton Jacobi equation that raises to Hamilton Jacobi equations in Wasserstein space. Formally, uh, you understand it immediately. Uh, now, uh, of course, uh, justifying requires some machinery, uh, but maybe because we are more analysts and probabilists, we believe it's clear, uh, but at least it's more general. Um, I don't want to uh, emphasize too much the results on class deviations. I just want in, to summarize. That uh, uh, because mainly of telecommunications, also uh, in, in finance, people are working hard on large random matrices, uh, and there are many other phenomena that I don't have time to to describe, like the so-called spike phenomenon, uh, where you have a bunch of uh, uh, eigenvalues that are detached from the spectrum. Uh, that there are good real life reasons to uh, get into these. Uh, um, uh, very classical subject, uh, that there are new methods which are more analytical to handle the equations, understand the equations, uh, all the way to numerical analysis of the equations, uh, which has not been written, although we have made lots of numerical approximations and uh, numerical uh, experiments, and the, by the way, the C1 half conjecture. Um, uh, that this is a subject which has lots and lots of problems uh, and uh, interesting applications. And what I believe are fun maths, I mean, at least for me. Uh, I'm sorry uh, I went a little bit too quickly, but that's what happens when I'm tired and I'm more than tired. Uh, I'm completely exhausted. Uh, I want to thank you, to thank the organizer and uh, my old friend Enrique, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, for the invitations. Maybe you regret regret now <laughs> of inviting me after the talk. Uh, I, uh, but uh, it, it, it was a, a, a real pleasure to do it. And uh, without having to travel uh, 10,000 kilometers uh, and uh, uh, wasting a lot of uh, uh, precious uh, uh, atmosphere. Hmm? Thank you very, very much. And uh, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Pierre-Louis. Uh...
Thank you very much for your talk, for your very interesting talk. And now, uh, if you want, we have uh, some time for a question. Uh, you can uh, write uh, your question in the chat, or you can uh, you can indicate me, and uh, we'll give you the the possibility to speak. Is there any question there? Okay, I, I I would like to to make you a question by curiosity. It's just uh, when you have written the question for F, uh, the probability the, the the distribution function for the for the measure M that satisfies the Tyson equation. Uh, yeah. Is there any, uh, uh, how can I say, is there, it's just for, by curiosity, is there any connection to some kind of fluids? If you find the uh, uh, velocity, which is depending uh, on, it reminds me the something specific. like the geostroph <laughs> geostrophic fluids or something like this. Yeah, okay, so the, um, uh, it's a good question. Uh, so in 1D fluids, in 1D are a little bit limited, uh, but uh, formally it's like a Vlasov equation and what you have is uh, uh, like a velocity that depends on the density. Yeah? H of M is a, vel is a velocity and it's a, uh, this uh, a complex function of M. Uh, which is obtained by uh, uh, applying a non-local operator to M. So it starts looking a little bit like, uh, you know, the Euler equations, uh, uh, but it's not per se exactly, uh, uh, um, uh, it's not exactly per se a, 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 fluidic, equa a fluidic equation. Um, this is 1D, so uh, uh, it turns out that there are no uh, analogs of that theory in 2D. People believe that there were a certain uh, uh, interaction uh, question uh, in 2D that uh, uh, would correspond to something about random matrices. It turns out it's wrong. Uh, although the interaction, it's uh, having some kind of... Uh, 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 Coulombic interaction in uh, 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 in 2D, and it turns out that this is really very, very close to the uh, 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 Euler equation in 2D. So uh, I don't think it fits in, or well, one never knows, but I've never encountered this type of equation with Hilbert transform like uh, objects uh, in uh, fluid models. Uh, but it's very close, and uh, 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 and clearly uh, some ideas. So in one D, this is really a lot of equations, and clearly there are ideas of uh, stemming from lots of equations that are there. And if you want to think of numerical approximations, you're gonna uh, you're gonna have to modify uh, particle methods. Uh, for those uh, nonlinear equations. Uh, so, in fact, uh, there is something interesting to, to do, which would be a, a full numeric analysis of particle methods uh, or other methods. Uh, what about Fourier techniques? Um, curious. Uh, we have just made numerical simulations by uh, particle like methods. Some of you, but that's the usual game with particle methods. We start with particles, get a continuous equation, and we discretize uh, uh, back to particles. And uh, Enrique, of course, knows uh, this game, but uh, I, I want to make sure that all the young people in the audience are aware that there is no contradiction, because we ah. start with particles uh, with mass 1 over n, you get a continuous equation, and what you create are not the same yeah. particles. They are like macro particles, which are much more adapted to the solutions. Okay, so uh, um, that would be a natural. I don't want to to, to do that. I, uh, my courses uh, won't do it. Uh, uh, but this is typically doing a good numerical analysis of the Dyson equation. That would be something uh, useful, and uh, where you know young people uh, or not so young people 
uh, would uh, get interested in a new subject. So that's uh, another recommendation. That's okay. easier than the conjecture C1 alpha. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes, uh, I was, uh, in fact, I was thinking of it. Well, uh, I was thinking of the possibility to adapt some kind of methods that uh, we know will work well uh, in the sense you say, but of course, uh, you have to take into account the fact that you do two things that are not uh, probably commutative. So uh, you have to be careful. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Is there any uh, comment or question or? Enrique, no, no chat. The chat, okay. Yes, there's something in the chat. Uh, someone who says, what connection of large random matrices and economic gain theory and cooperative gains is possible? <laughs> it's a matrix of AN. Thank you, teacher Leon. <laughs> uh, that's that's a ni nice message, uh, especially the uh, teacher Leon part. Uh, um, Okay, so um, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, I suspect the only thing I know is that there are connections with finance, as I said, about correlations. Uh, but it may be uh, that there are also connections in, uh, uh, the, it may be that there are also connections uh, uh, in, with game theory and economics. Uh, I'm not aware of any, but it, it makes sense because in many, many situations where you have lots of data, lots of agents and so on, you have lots of independence, uh, then the correlations uh, will be uh, naturally, that will naturally lead you to, uh, lead you to those uh, large random matrices. Uh, but precisely, I'm not aware of anything. Is there any progress in the proof of the C11 yeah. half conjecture? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, no. Uh, and in fact, I have very little evidence. It's an excellent question, but uh, uh, I have very little evidence that this is true. Um, okay, numerically. Okay, so typically, uh, what one expects is that uh, you have a nice support. Why nice? Because uh, you, after all, you are in 1D, okay? And so the things can go wrong is when the, two, the support tends to uh, increase. So uh, part of what you would have to investigate is that uh, you to the interval in the support may merge at some time. So when they merge, you have to analyze whether this creates a singularity. Okay, and they have a tendency to grow. So you won't have three supports merging. Uh, so what happens when they merge? We have no clue in the interval. Uh, so if you assume the, if you know that they are continuous, uh, then they are infinity inside the support. Uh, it's natural, not easy, but natural. Uh, there are some uh, technical difficulty. So there are, I think, two uh, directions, uh, two major steps. One would be to prove continuity because that's a threshold regularity. Once you have continuity, yeah, uh, then you may start to work. Continuity, and we have, we have an infinity. So how to prove continuity, I don't know. And I, I'm sure it's true, but I have absolutely no clue about the proof. I tried to, to do scaling and, uh, 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 you know, scaling arguments and so on, I didn't go anywhere, okay. Uh, the uh, uh, and then the next question is the analysis of what takes place near the boundary near the the boundary of the support, uh, you know, like this uh, 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 semi semicircle uh, uh, going up 
uh, at those boundary intervals, and then there is a merging of two branches, two parts of the support. Okay, so that would be that might be just the wrong proof. Maybe there is one way to prove directly the full uh, the full regularity. But he, uh, if we want to understand really what's going on in such equations, uh, uh, we need answers to uh, to to uh, the various steps I, I mentioned. So as you saw, I have more questions than progress, or <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, and we have tried. Um, I, I've asked uh, many people, uh, uh, many, many people, and um, it seems delicate. OK, thank you very much again. Uh, I ah. <laughs> uh, there is one more question. Finish. As an undergraduate student, I would like to know an example of large random matrices applied in physics. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, in fact, large random matrices are uh, we are being sought by Dyson uh, as uh, um, a mathematical representation of uh, the complexity uh, of the spectrum of uh, let's say atoms okay of mm -hmm. quantum atomic structures to be more specific and he, he, he made a conjecture uh, that uh, somehow a great part of the spectrum would behave exactly as a spectrum of large random matrices. So in some sense, it was not saying that there is a large random matrix in uh, quantum mechanics, but that large random matrices are a good substitute uh, to understand a very difficult uh, uh, um, a very difficult uh, landscape of uh, 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 of the very difficult landscape of spectra in, in uh, uh, atomic quantum physics. So it was uh, uh, it was um, a conjecture, uh, very much related to statistical quantum mechanics. If you want to be a little more precise, uh, it was one way to uh, for him to uh, uh, make. A problem that seems untractable, tractable, since thanks to that analogy, and this is why in the after Dyson, uh, the theory of large random matrices has been developed a lot by statistical physicists. Not always bothering to make proofs, but there are books and uh, hundreds of pa of papers in the physics literature exploring. Uh, what was going on, like Marchenko and Pasteur, for instance, exploring like uh, what was known, uh, 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 what is possible on large random matrices, still hoping that this would prove or disprove uh, Dyson uh, conjecture or Dyson program. Very, very interesting piece of uh, uh, science history. I mean, this uh, Dyson story, and Dyson was a an extraordinary scientist. Um, so, but, but maybe uh, his intuition was wrong. So, I hope I answered your question. Uh, physicists are interested by analogy in large random matrices, and have made lots of absolutely uh, important studies much before mathematicians uh, were able to make proofs. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. There is a last question uh, by <laughs> Jokina Fernandez. This is the last one, I think. Uh, how did the Fields Medal recognition impact in your career? Okay, um, I didn't want it to have any impact, so it had no impact. Uh, I, why I didn't want it to uh, to uh, to have uh, an impact, so it, some people change their behavior towards me. Uh, the people that uh, disliked me before disliked me afterwards. The people that liked me before uh, liked me afterwards. Uh, uh, and that's okay. Um, uh, no, it, it turns out that, uh, okay, this is, this is just a story before going to bed for me. Uh, uh, the, the, this is just, a, it turns out that four years before I got it, uh, uh, Peter Lacks, which is one of my gods, uh, 
uh, came to me uh, in Japan and told me, uh, Pierre Louis, you were among the, uh, uh, you, 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 you made it to the final round uh, for the Fields Medal. And so I was 34. Uh, I knew I had one more chance and uh, I had two options, either start thinking about it or uh, ignore it completely. Uh, start uh, starting thinking about it would uh, uh, would have probably led <laughs> to insanity uh, for me uh, because I'm a really obsessive guy. So I completely ignore the subject on purpose, and I did so great a job mentally. Then when <laughs> I was I received a phone call one evening, well, you know, you you have it. Uh, I was happy for a week, <laughs> and then. Uh, you know, all this mental conditioning <laughs> destroyed any uh, 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 any uh, you know extreme feeling of happiness. Uh, so, uh, so this is why this didn't change anything. Uh, uh, and I want uh, I continue to work exactly as I used to work, not in terms of quality, but in terms of uh, activity. Uh, uh, which is uh, working with others. Uh, it's so much more fun to work with other mathematicians than working by yourself alone. Uh, so, and uh, it was fun. So maybe some people didn't look at me in the same way, but uh, that's their problem, not mine. Uh, no, um, whatever happens in your life, bad and good, uh, uh, you know, I'm old enough so I can make statements like that. Whatever happens uh, to you in your professional life, uh, good and or bad, just keep on working and try to ignore it as much as you can. Mass is more fun than all all this mess. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much again, and uh, we are going to stop now. Uh, thank you, and uh, let's uh, turn to bye bye. <laughs> Bye bye, and uh, I don't know if Isabel is already here, but I I I I want to apologize to her and to you that I can't stay for the uh, second lecture, and uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, knowing her and having lots of respect and uh, esteem for her, uh, you're gonna have a very you're gonna listen to a very good talk soon. Good night. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye bye. Lot, lot good night. No. Good Thank afternoon you for you. <laughs> Bye bye.